Hello, and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a bi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're going to be taking a look at PETA. Again, honestly, God, sorry. PETA and Autism Speaks are two companies that I've made several videos on simply because there seems to be no end in sight to their terrible behavior. It is time to stop the abuse! Let's go ahead and give a quick overview on PETA for anyone who might be new here, and then we're gonna go into exactly what we're discussing about in today's episode on PETA. PETA stands for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, but they seem to be anything but that. According to records, PETA's animal shelter in Norfolk killed nearly 90% of its animals last year, saying they were unadoptable. But how hard did they try to save them? PETA puts down most of the animals in its care at a rate so high it's nearly 80% in some cases that lawmakers have even called their shelters a way station of death and tried to rein them in. They like to run shock campaigns and public stunts to get attention instead of actually spreading a meaningful message. One could argue that, hey, it's like clickbait and you gotta do what you gotta do to get eyes on your cause. But many also argue that their messaging is completely lost in the shock value. They also believe that having pets is selfish, so it's not really shocking that they're okay with killing so many dogs and cats, really. And then when words don't work, they've literally just mailed coconuts to people that they believe use monkey labor to get coconuts from trees. And the practice isn't quite as black and white as PETA makes it out to be either, though that is an entirely separate video. The point is that PETA often fails at getting their message across and they are massive hypocrites at best. Today, we're going to be discussing a few more instances of their hypocrisy, and that's the way that PETA seems to hold the general public at a higher standard than the celebrities they work with. Also, as an aside, while I would never consider PETA a good source of information, obviously you will see them listed quite a few times in my sources today, simply to show that I'm not misquoting them when I explain a situation. And as another aside, please don't turn this one into a drinking game because of how many times I say hypocrisy in this episode because I don't want you getting hurt and I'm gonna say it a lot. Anyway, this episode isn't to attack any singular celebrity in particular, but PETA's relationship with them. So we will start by addressing the times PETA has basically contradicted themselves and the hypocrisy itself, and then we'll get into those specific individuals. So let's dive right in. In some articles, PETA does seem to hold celebrities to the same standards as us regular plebeian normies. One November 2020 post of theirs reads, when PETA saw newly purchased dogs popping up on Instagram feeds of stars such as Channing Tatum, Viola Davis, Jennifer Lopez, Shia LaBeouf, J Balvin, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, and James Charles, <coughs> all of them whom bought puppies just in the last few months, we knew we had to take action. So this week, PETA will debut a full page letter in The Hollywood Reporter with some help from Max the shelter dog who begs famous people to stop hurting dogs like him by purchasing puppies. PETA will also debut a billboard in Hollywood with a very simple message for all to see, stop buying dogs. In the midst of a global pandemic, these influential celebrities have made a national crisis even worse by purchasing dogs. These stars and influencers are setting a dangerous example for their millions of impressionable fans and fueling demand for purpose-bred dogs while millions of animals await adoption in shelters as we speak, desperate for good loving homes. The US faces a companion animal overpopulation crisis as an estimated 70 million dogs and cats struggle to survive on the streets. And that staggering number doesn't include the more than 6 million companion animals coming through our country's shelter system every year. For celebrities used to getting everything they want when they want it, guess what? They still can. There's a beautiful thing called petfinder.com where everyone from A-listers to mere mortals like us can identify an animal who already exists and is in need of a good home. One whose age, temperament, and activity level are all fit to our lifestyle. And PETA just makes it abundantly clear that if you're not adopting from a shelter, you are purposefully hurting other pets. And don't get me wrong, I think adopting is incredibly important. And if you can, please adopt instead of purchasing. But I understand that sometimes it's not in the cards for everybody. And if PETA wanted to help, maybe they could educate people on what a responsible breeder is as well and how to find one or even how to become one. But instead they take the hard stance that if you buy a dog from a breeder, you're basically just killing other dogs. And yet, though this post of theirs is targeted directly at celebrities, the hypocrisy under their FAQ is just stunning. Here's what it says. By taking a stand against even one form of animal abuse or exploitation, and by helping us educate the public about these issues, our celebrity supporters are making a big difference. 
By helping us publicize the truth about animal suffering, they are helping to save the lives of countless animals. To deny people the chance to speak out against something they believe in simply because they may not be all the way there on animal rights issues would be unfair to them and to the animals. And PETA, I need you to make up your mind here. Are you going to call celebrities out on bad behavior or just say, oh, it's okay because they support us? There are so many instances of this that it's not just a one or two time thing where PETA has said, hey, we don't totally agree with the celebrity, but we like their support, so we're not gonna criticize them as hard. It's more that they actively ignore stances taken by celebrities or public figures that are in their wheelhouse. For example, as one source states, in 2014, Mayor Bill de Blasio was named PETA's person of the year, but PETA must have been grading its contestants on a curve. When Mayor de Blasio was mocked by Jon Stewart and numerous media outlets for his Pizzagate debacle, he ate pizza with a fork, a taboo in New York City. It should be noted this infamous dish had sausage on it, as well as cheese, of course, a big no-no in PETA's world. That's not all. Bill de Blasio recently visited a zoo, even though PETA works to shut down all animal exhibits. While we think that PETA's position is radical and unwarranted, in the case of Bill de Blasio, maybe it's for the best that he avoid these facilities. During a recent zoo trip, he inadvertently killed a groundhog after dropping it. Is de Blasio a horrible person specifically for eating sausage pizza and accidentally killing a groundhog? Well, I mean, how does one accidentally kill a groundhog, but eating sausage pizza is okay, I guess? I don't know, but Mayor de Blasio has done some good in PETA's eyes since he's introduced a bill to retire horses used for carriage rides. And New York City has become the first city to ban the sale of rabbits in pet stores. And Universe Soul Circus was temporarily banned for not giving legally required space to tigers and failing to provide tuberculosis tests for their elephants. I won't say that Mayor de Blasio hasn't done a lot of good for animals in New York City or anything, he absolutely has. But I also find it hypocritical that PETA blames the organizers of the Groundhog event, says that the mayor can be forgiven for thinking it was a harmless gimmick, and yet PETA will not give any member of the public that same benefit of the doubt for forgiveness. Now that you've got a bit of a taste for what we're going to be getting into today, let's get into some more specific ad campaigns and a few more instances of their ethical treatment not applying to celebrities. One of their massive supporters is Pamela Anderson. In one PETA campaign, Pamela was featured in a bathtub with the text, could you live in a bathtub for decades, talking about the dolphins and whales held captive at SeaWorld. And don't get me wrong, SeaWorld's treatment of orcas is horrific. And I think the question, could you live in a bathtub is effective messaging. However, the implied nudity doesn't really seem necessary. I'm not trying to sound like a prude here, but she's also been featured in some questionable advertising, such as one that reads all animals have the same parts all over her own naked body. One article states, in the past, Anderson has stripped down for several other PETA campaigns. In 2003, she bared it all for PETA's I'd rather go naked than wear fur advertising campaign. And in June, 2006, the sultry star posed topless in a window display of a Stella McCartney boutique in London. Anderson had said that she would rather take her clothes off if the PETA humanitarian awards raised enough money that night, which they did. But not all of Anderson's ads have gone off without a hitch. In September, 2009, a CNN airport network refused to air a video of her stripping to raise awareness for PETA. I can understand the bathtub campaign having the implied nudity because she's in a tub, that kind of makes sense. But again, there's a pattern here. PETA seems to want Pamela on their side simply for sex appeal instead of actual effective messaging. Whether or not you agree, that's fine, but there's no denying that Pamela Anderson is also a massive hypocrite to the message she preaches. So it's hardly any wonder she fits in great with PETA. According to one recent Australia news source released about a year and a half ago, Sky News digital editor, Jack Hooten, Hollywood hypocrisy reached new levels of absurdity this week when Pamela Anderson, who is in town to film motoring industry commercials, thought it appropriate to lecture Australians about climate change and their diets. Activists rejoice when the Baywatch star pressured the Queensland government to ban meat at official functions and linked the latest deadly bushfires directly to climate change. As you've already noted, the science is clear. Climate change has played a key role in the severity of this year's bushfires, Anderson said. Just as your government is surely working on emission saving energy and transport policies, you could lead by example by implementing a climate friendly vegan food policy for government functions, along with transitioning the menu at sometime strangers restaurant at Parliament House to an all vegan one. Australia thanks you for your insights, Professor Anderson. Now, could you please cash your check from Ultratune and hop back home on your fuel guzzling plane? 
While in the air, perhaps think about the hypocrisy of accepting money from a motoring company while flying around the world on carbon producing planes. The discourse on this topic has already been perverted by activists who are using the deaths and tragedies of bushfires to propagate their political goals. We don't need washed up Hollywood hacks to profit from virtue signaling while we are still mourning as a nation, not that Australia's activists mind. They happily promote Professor Anderson and requote her flawed science and inaccurate data to call for absurd notions like zero carbon emissions by 2030. Extremist group PETA has one organization to cash in on the professor's comments. It penned an article saying governments should heed her advice to save lives in the future. Yes, not listening to Professor Anderson equates to murder. These are the same activists who get their scientific advice from the 11,000 scientists who declared a climate emergency in an online petition recently. The decorated list of scientists included the names like Mickey Mouse, Harry Potter, and his old headmaster, Albus Dumbledore. Suddenly, Pamela Anderson's thoughts on science seem comparatively not as absurd. So what does the science say about bushfires? Does research exist directly linking previous emissions policies to contemporary bushfires? No, there has not been a release of any scientific report analyzing the cause of these specific bushfires yet. There were a number of factors such as drought, surface soil moisture, wind speed that all played a role in these bushfires. And yet Pamela Anderson basically just showed up to Australia, said, hey, climate change is awful. You should eat vegan food and then left on a plane. Greta Thunberg, the teenage Swedish climate activist travels by boat because it's better for the environment. So even she recognizes how hypocritical it would be to speak about climate change while traveling by plane. And the online petitions that apparently anyone could sign with a fake name, that's not real science, okay? Pretty sure Mickey Mouse isn't an expert on global warming. This isn't at all the first time Pamela has been branded as a hypocrite, considering that she's worn and promoted fur and leather in the past too. The Center for Consumer Freedom has also questioned if Pamela be held to her own rhetorical standards back in 2004 when they wrote, quote, The Buxom Star has criticized NASCAR driver Dale Earnhardt Jr. for endorsing KFC saying, when you take a multi-million dollar endorsement from a company, you must also take some responsibility for the company's practices. But Anderson lends her name to the radical PETA, which supports the restaurant firebombing Animal Liberation Front. And PETA also opposes research that may lead to a cure for Anderson's own disease. The journal points out a striking contradiction from the silicone enhanced screen goddess. PETA opposes all animal testing. That ought to be of interest to Miss Anderson, who suffers from hepatitis C, a virus that puts her at high risk for liver disease and liver cancer. The American Liver Foundation believes that animal testing is essential for finding a cure. And Miss Anderson herself served in 2002 as Grand Marshal for an American Liver Foundation fundraiser. Must have left her PETA shirt at home that day. The journal concludes with a simple question that we've raised before. If KFC and Mr. Earnhardt are to be held accountable for their associates, what about PETA and Miss Anderson, end quote. I really don't think it was necessary to call her buxom and silicone enhanced. What the hell, that's kind of weird, uh, but come on consumer freedom. If you're going to question Pamela's ethics, there's zero need to go after her appearance, no matter how good or bad looking she may be. Aside from the irritating descriptors though, the point still stands. Pamela has refused to do the ice bucket challenge because she believes the ASL is wrong to test on animals. And that's absolutely her prerogative. However, when it's her illness that she's raising awareness for, some animal testing is okay. You know, if it wasn't Pamela Anderson, PETA would be furious. They're so quick to jump down the throats of people they don't agree with, but in this case, the hypocrisy is fine. It's not as if the hypocrisy doesn't directly affect PETA at times either. Pamela Anderson sold her Dodge Viper car for PETA, a car with a leather interior. PETA even wrote an entire blog about it and how fantastic it was that she was doing this. But wouldn't you think PETA would also speak out against the sale, against making money from something they don't support? Also, as an aside, even though the car Pamela wanted next, she demanded have no furs or hides in it, the car was named the world's most polluting vehicle and one of the least environmentally friendly vehicles on the market. But there's no leather in it, so I guess that cancels her out in PETA's mind. It's especially odd to me, while they can forgive Pamela Anderson for her double standards, they can't forgive one man that advocates for forgiveness as mercy as his job, the Pope. Pope Benedict, who resigned in 2013 before Pope Francis took over, sparked some controversy when he went against the Catholic Church's position on condoms. Many religious organizations have opposed birth control despite a survey in 2002 finding that 96% of sexually active Catholic women use it. 
The church argued that artificial birth control devalued sex's purpose and diminished responsibility, particularly with men, opening the way to abuse and rape. Officially, as Pius XI ruled in 1930, frustrating the procreative act is an offense against the law of God and of nature, and those who indulge in such acts are branded with the guilt of a grave sin. Contraception has been called slayers of potential children, and since condoms are only 90% effective in preventing HIV infection, a risk remains and you're better off without one, according to the late Colombian Cardinal Alfonso Trujillo anyway. I kind of feel like if something is 90% effective at preventing illness, I'd rather take that than have absolutely no protection at all, but okay. Anyway, Pope Benedict went against the grain and said that condom use may be acceptable under certain circumstances to reduce the risk of HIV infection. One late 2010 article stated, beginning at the Vatican last week and soon moving on to cathedrals and churches across the US, PETA members are going to be handing out leaflets featuring an image of the Pope holding a condom and the message, dogs and cats can't use condoms. We are in the midst of an unholy animal overpopulation crisis, spay or neuter today. Some Roman Catholics who can't conceive of the idea that religion can be the subject of humor are in an uproar over this too, while others find nothing offensive about the ad given that the Pope has advocated kindness to animals numerous times. The pontiff has a lot on his plate and hasn't got around to this issue yet, but he might given that saving the lives of homeless dogs and cats is inarguably kind. The Catholic League obviously and understandably had a ton of issues with this. I mean, yes, it exploits the Pope, but also yet again shows their incredible hypocrisy Democracy. The president of the Catholic League, Bill Donahue stated, the statement accompanying this campaign says, it is sinful that millions of dogs and cats are killed every year in animal shelters simply because there aren't enough homes for all of them. What is truly sinful is how PETA lies. In 2008, it was disclosed by the Center for Consumer Freedom that PETA kills 95% of the adoptable pets in its care. Indeed, PETA delivered the death sentence to 21,339 cats and dogs between 1998 and 2008 at its headquarters in Norfolk, Virginia. There is something perverse about an organization that has to rip off the Pope while violating its own mission on a daily basis just to stay in business. And let's be clear again, PETA, you are the one killing animals. Like they know that, right? Did you actually just not care about animals at all? It baffles me to the extent that PETA can say one thing and then just do something totally opposite. They urge Pope Benedict in one breath to go green and make the next Pope mobile without any leather seats. They try to veganize the Vatican, yet they say Steve Irwin, quote, died while harassing a Ray, end quote, on their Twitter on what would have been his 57th birthday. The thing is, Steve Irwin has been remembered by his influence of encouraging millions to learn and explore nature and the creatures out there. He relocated endangered crocodiles to prevent their deaths and he was a serious conservationist. It's mind boggling to me that PETA seems to pick and choose what they get upset by. Of course, the hypocrisy hasn't ended and has only continued with Pope Francis. At first in 2015, PETA loved the Pope. They wrote, he is the first Pope to take the name of St. Francis of Assisi, patron saint of all animals who said, not to hurt our humble brethren is our first duty to them, but to stop there is not enough. We have a higher mission to be of service to them whenever they require it. And he is also the first religious leader to be picked as PETA's person of the year, a title previously held by Bill Clinton, Oprah Winfrey, and Ricky Gervais. Pope Francis was chosen for asking the world's 1.2 billion Roman Catholics and all citizens of the world to reject human domination over God's creation, treat animals with kindness and respect the environment. Something PETA views as a call to turn towards a simple plant-based diet, given the now well-established role of animal agriculture in climate change. The Pope has spoken about treating animals with kindness, so PETA featured him in a number of articles and even dressed their PETA advocates up as nuns with signs that read, eating meat is a bad habit. Very punny, PETA. They couldn't praise him enough up until 2018. It seems when the Pope invited 2000 homeless people and refugees to attend a circus performance in Rome, that all changed. His Holiness's concern for the downtrodden must rightly extend to the wild animals who have been taken from their homelands and are enslaved, caged, chained, and beaten. So they'll perform tricks that baffle and stress them, PETA said. Again, PETA is now upset with the Pope for this, but they're totally gonna overlook Mayor de Blasio taking part in a stunt that killed an actual groundhog.
And how can you let the singer Pink star in a PETA ad that says, rather go naked than wear fur, but stay quiet when she wears leather and swims in marine parks, which they believe should be shuttered and closed down. The Pope invited these people to attend a circus, receive a free medical checkup and a sack lunch. So it wasn't just a show either. Maybe PETA was simply mad the Pope hadn't appeared in one of their ads yet when his predecessor did. But before we continue to talk about the next person that PETA has a hypocritical relationship with, let's take a moment to thank today's sponsor. We've all got goals to be healthy, find a work-life balance, improve our relationships, but have you ever thought about your hair goals? Like real talk, if you don't love your hair, why not? Maybe it's your current hair care routine. So now is the time to try Function of Beauty instead. Function of Beauty is the world leader in customizable beauty, offering precise formulations for your hair's specific needs. And it's super simple to get started. All you do is take a quick quiz and tell them a little bit about your hair type and your goals, such as lengthening, volumizing, or oil control. And then you choose your color or your fragrance, or you can go fragrance and dye free too. Then the Function team determines the perfect blend of ingredients, bottles your formula, and delivers it right to you. And every ingredient used is vegan and cruelty-free, and they never use any sulfates or parabens. And you have an option to go silicone-free as well. So don't buy off the shelf just to be disappointed again and again. Go to functionofbeauty.com casket and take the quiz and save 20% on your first order. Again, that applies to their full range of hair, skin, and body products. Make sure to go to functionofbeauty.com slash casket to let them know we sent you and get 20% off your first order. Again, that's functionofbeauty.com slash casket. Another celebrity endorser PETA has worked with is Jenna Jameson, who they refer to as the world-renowned queen of the adult film industry. They state, Jenna is living proof that pleather is certainly sexy, but if you need more reasons to try this alternative to leather, then consider the animals. Most cows, pigs, and sheep who are slaughtered for their skin endure miserable lives in factory farms where extreme crowding, deprivation, unanathized castration, branding, and dehorning are common. By choosing pleather, you are keeping the fun alive and helping animals. What could be better? Advocating for pleather, that's fine, but this is seemingly the only time Jameson has done it. In her video with PETA, she claims to have lived half her life in pleather, but there's an entire post about her on leathercelebrities.com that says she's wearing a leather skirt, leather shoes, leather jacket, etc. One article goes right into Jenna and states, her entire life is a fucking lie. Two months ago, she did her PETA ad promoting pleather over leather. But two weeks ago, she was wearing a leather bomber jacket leaving the Amica nightclub in London. You know, the trip where she allegedly was thrown out of a nightclub for possibly trying to do drugs there. Over at deceiver.com, they made the observation that Jenna's leather bomber jacket is not a pleather bomber jacket, but real leather because of the members only tag on the front. The brand is making a comeback. Last month, Jenna was photographed eating live lobsters at Pastis in New York with her bodyguard. Those pictures were previously posted. Jenna and Tito, her boyfriend at the time, went on a Caribbean fishing trip in October, 2007, where they caught five mahi, one yellowfin, and an 82 pound wahoo. PETA has a big problem with fishing and says that fish feel the same pain that people do and quotes, if you wouldn't do this to a dog, why do it to a fish? But this should be no surprise considering Jenna's entire life and career is a sham filled with lies, over-exaggerations, and false acclaims and accomplishments. PETA is also a sham. I can't vouch for Jenna's life as a whole and just a cursory search of her name shows a lot of dramatics and relationship and drug issues and I'm not here for that today. I don't think Jenna is an awful person for eating oysters, even though they're not my thing personally, but PETA typically does have an issue with that. PETA consistently states that animals are not ours to eat and they strongly oppose speciesism, a human supremacist worldview. Then why PETA don't you find advocates that actually practice what they preach? Could it be because people that take a few minutes to Google you realize they won't do the same and you're just a massive kill shelter? How can they tell everyone not to eat animals and wear pleather, but then their own endorsers don't follow those rules? Another example of this is when PETA has also said that Eva Mendez has spoke out against wearing fur when she realized how cruel the fur industry was. In one post they write, An undercover investigation of Chinese fur farms reveal that dogs and cats frequently end up in traps and cages and fur is often mislabeled when it's sold. So there's really no way to know what kind of animal a piece of fur came from. More than half of the finished fur garments imported for sale in the US contain fur that came from China. 
Eva says, at a time when there is so much violence in the world, this is one type of violence that all of us can help stop by being informed consumers. And yet, while Eva Mendez took part in the I'd rather go naked than wear fur nude campaign, saying that wearing fur is ignorant and has even offered faux fur garments as part of her clothing line, other sources have shown her with a crocodile clutch and in photo shoots with fur. The same could be said of Khloe Kardashian, who also has worn fur after her fur I'd rather go naked campaign too. Another source states, Surprisingly, Penelope Cruz, a bona fide international movie star, joined the PETA roster. To Spaniards, French, and Italians, it is rather funny because Miss Cruz is often photographed in Europe wearing fur. We understand the PETA campaigns are just for public relations, but still, what happened to truth and honesty? One of the worst examples of this might actually be Dita Von Teese, who not only wears fur, but has her own fur clothing line. According to my sources, Dita's even aware of this and doesn't see why it would be a problem. Pita's totally aware of me, she once told people. I'm not working with Pita to tell people to be vegetarians or stop wearing fur. I am there to strictly speak about spaying and neutering your pets. Pita had responded by saying, she said she had some vintage furs she wears occasionally. Pita often works with a celebrity on an issue they feel comfortable supporting, whether it's supporting spaying or neutering or speaking out against products that are tested on animals. So they may not be an animal rights activist, but their contribution to any of our campaigns is appreciated. How come PETA demands that us normies or anyone who isn't a celebrity should abide by their way and not wear furs, be vegan and spread awareness or you know, otherwise we're just not good enough? Also, do they want us to spay and neuter pets or is having pets unethical in the first place? Which one is it? It's a little confusing because they seem so caught up in having celebrities spread their message that they don't seem to care if celebrities actually agree with the message in the first place. The fur and leather hypocrisy is very real here. However, it's about to get worse. PETA's advertising gets far more than questionable, but in the past, it's gotten downright dangerous. According to their own blog post, and I feel weird calling them articles because it feels like I'd be implying they're informative or you know, maybe giving them too much credit, but here's what they say. The inescapable images of violence towards animals seem to have a profound effect on the audience. PETA member Justin Strange was working at the information table that we set up at every Morrissey show, and as he watched, three people had to be carried out. When Morrissey played his song, Meat is Murder, the giant screen behind him started to play scenes of graphic violence from inside slaughterhouses and factory farms. Many people couldn't bear to even look in the direction of the stage. Partway into the song, a young woman fainted and had to be carried outside of where the music was and into a hallway. Soon after, two more people, a man and a woman, were also brought out. The security staff shouted out, they're dropping like flies in here and frantically radioed for all available EMTs to mobilize. EMTs appeared in a matter of seconds and revived all three people with smelling salts, gave them water and took their blood pressure. All three of them were white as ghosts and clearly shaken up. As soon as they were able to get on their feet, all of them grabbed a PETA vegan starter kit. First of all, I really doubt that every single one of these people immediately grabbed a vegan starter kit. Maybe they just grabbed it for the food or something because they felt lightheaded. Secondly, maybe warn your audience first, like what the absolute hell Morrissey and PETA? Morrissey even goes so far to say that eating animals is the same as pedophilia because according to him, they are both rape, violence, and murder. So think about that for a moment. Maybe don't. Morrissey fits right in with PETA, honestly, as he doesn't seem to have much value for human life either. According to one source, in a sweeping gesture of stupidity, Morrissey showed his true colors once more in 2011 when speaking about the Norway terrorist massacre where 77 people were killed, declaring, that is nothing compared to what happens at McDonald's and Kentucky Fried shit every day. In an interview, Morrissey once stated, reggae is to me the most racist music in the entire world. It's an absolute total glorification of black supremacy. He went on, ultimately, I don't have very cast iron opinions on black music other than black modern music, which I detest. I detest Stevie Wonder. I think Diana Ross is awful. I think they're all vile in the extreme. In essence, this music doesn't say anything. The interviewer responded, you seem to be saying that you believe there is some sort of black pop conspiracy being organized to keep white indie groups down. What was Morrissey's response? Yes, I really do. I guess I really can't say it's hypocritical that Morrissey is a PETA spokesperson since their values do seem to align. Still, it's not as if that reflects well on PETA when the celebrity that at least seems hypocritical is also racist and who's expressed admiration for Hitler and who has described Chinese people as a subspecies. 
And yet we're still not done here. Talking about PETA spokespeople that is, because there's still one more massively hypocritical spokesperson I wanted to talk about, and that's Steve-O. And this one's gonna be a little hard for me because Steve-O is part of like what I grew up around. I watched like Jackass, I watched Bam Margera, I watched anything that MTV2 would shovel down my throat that included that group of guys. So I admit this one's gonna be a little difficult for me to go through and talk about, but I have to do it nonetheless. Steve-O has at times been praised as a hero among animal rights activists. He's done stunts to gain attention, like scaling a construction crane while carrying an inflatable orca whale. According to my source, PETA, the animal rights organization that honored Steve-O with its top advocacy award in 2011, gave the stuntman's latest protest props on social media. Elsewhere on Twitter, some activists anointed the former MTV star a fearless legend and a champion of animal advocacy. But it's unclear whether the dangerous demonstration will have any effect in swaying those who aren't staunchly anti-SeaWorld. Steve-O's alignment with the animal rights movement could even backfire, especially considering his polarizing public persona. In 2016, PETA put out another post about him, saying that he's taken part in their anti-fur ads, anti-skins video, and he's even gone vegan. Steve-O admits that he wasn't always an animal advocate, but he first realized that animals deserve to be treated fairly when he worked at a circus. Steve-O claimed that as his platform grew, he began to use it in order to promote animal rights as well. The interview with Steve-O makes him look great, honestly. He admits that he wasted LA resources by climbing that crane because all of these first responders were called onto the scene. He sounds like he's always cared about animal welfare and he promotes a fantastic vegan diet. So what's the catch? Well, it's painting a false narrative. Steve-O didn't actually use his platform to talk about animal rights. More accurately, he built his platform on animal cruelty. As one petition states, Steve-O of jackass fame claims to be an advocate for animal rights, yet he continues to abuse and exploit animals on his new show, Killer Karaoke, as he has done in the past with Wild Boys. From various snakes to skunk, various birds, frogs, mice, and other animals who are clearly under stress and frightened by the noise, the contestants, and the whole show. Let's urge him to put his money where his mouth is and ask him to stop participating in the exploitation of animals for profit. How can PETA have him as a spokesperson without even acknowledging this, let alone condemning it? Oh, that's right, because they want the attention, not actual change. If animals aren't for entertainment in any capacity and killing them is wrong, obviously, then why would he guide a contestant on killer karaoke into a runway with a dead fish? On many, many occasions, and yes, these took part after he claimed to be an activist for PETA. PETA gave him the award in 2011, and then the show debuted in 2012. That makes sense, PETA, right? How can you support someone that abuses animals on live television? Is that somehow bringing awareness to your cause? But I suppose it hardly matters now because Steve-O has apparently left veganism behind. According to one source, the 2017 movie, What the Health, made by Cowspiracy filmmakers Kip Anderson and Keegan Kuhn, hit Netflix like a giant tofu meteor. It ricocheted around the internet. When I interview people at events or festivals about what turned them vegan, it's by far the most common answer I get. I watched What the Health, they inevitably tell me. The film dived into the health issues of the standard American diet. Steve appears in the film, but he says he wishes he hadn't. He takes specific issue with the claim in the film that animal products are the root causes of diabetes, potentially even more damaging than sugar. Diabetes is a national epidemic as obesity rates continue to rise across the US. The disease that once typically took hold in adulthood is now claiming lives in victims as young as age five. There's a growing body of evidence that suggests a plant-based diet may help reverse type two diabetes symptoms, but whether or not eating animals causes the problem is something Steve says isn't clear and should be a big red flag for anyone watching the film. To me, it not only sounds patently false, but it's reckless and irresponsible to say that, he said. I'm thinking that doesn't sound right, particularly because I'm personally in trouble with sugar. So he did his own research. And what do I find but video after video of people saying I myself am a vegan and what the health is a bunch of bullshit. There have been a number of criticisms of the film claiming it exaggerates facts. Publications including Time Magazine, Scientific American, and Vox have all poked holes in claims made in the film and questioned the authority of its experts. The film includes a lot of facts, but also a lot of opinion, anecdotes, unsubstantiated claims, misleading statements, and a few outright falsehoods, Scientific American notes. Just because someone has MD or PhD after their name does not guarantee that everything that comes out of their mouth is reliable. So my trust is gone now. I've been lied to. The vegan community is spreading fucking lies, Steve-O states. 
personally, I feel like there's a balance to be had here. I don't agree with Steve-O for saying the entire vegan community is spreading lies, but I don't agree with him dumping snakes and alligators into a tank on television for a show, then dunking a woman into said tank over and over again. I would say there are a few vegans out there that do more harm than good, such as the vegan teacher, but there's definitely a negative connotation around veganism. And I think that PETA is by far one of the most prominent reasons as to why. So seriously, fuck PETA. They want to hold everyone accountable to these standards of how animals should be treated, and yet they won't hold their celebrity spokespeople to it. And the most action they actually take is euthanizing animals that they claim to care so much about. Fuck PETA. But with that being said, that's where I'm going to end today's episode of the spicy corporate casket. Make sure to like, follow, and subscribe so that you can always stay up to date on the latest episodes whenever they go live. Thank you all again for making it to another corporate casket. Love you all, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.